Okay then, I know it's slightly before, but we're all sat down, so we might as well get cracking. Um, I'm really excited to present our next speaker, because when uh, we first decided, or Tom first decided, that we were going to have a TM English Icons, uh, and I was very luckily made the coordinator, we put out a call to all you lovely English teachers about who you'd like to hear speak at one of our events, and Mary's name popped up over and over and over, uh, and so I'm so excited to have her here with us today. Um, if, you, if you haven't heard of Mary, and I, I don't know how you wouldn't have, uh, Mary is an education advisor, writer and speaker. She works in schools talking to pupils, teachers and leaders about learning, leadership and the curriculum. She maintains that there are no quick fixes and that great outcomes for pupils are not achieved through tick boxes. She writes and speaks at conferences about leadership, curriculum and school improvement, which is where lots of you have seen her before and desperately wanted to hear her again. Um, she's got over 20 years worth of experience and she's going to share some of that, hopefully, in the next 45 minutes. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. I always say don't, don't tap at the start because it might be rubbish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it probably will be. Um, no, it's great to be here and, um, and to support this, particularly this first one. I mean, um, it's been great professional development for me, so thank you very much for letting me sit in on those marvellous uh, presentations. There, it, interestingly, um, I have not compared notes with anyone else who's speaking today, but there will be some common threads that will be repeated in mine. Uh, who'd have thought it that actually people who are thinking about stuff deeply actually find that we end up in, in very similar places, but obviously through different lens and through different experiences. Um, so just a bit about me and about why I do this work. So um, my background is secondary religious education, um, but I've also taught some English, some history, a um, little bit of maths, uh, some PSHE and some Latin at lunchtime. And... Um, <laughs> I uh, taught in London and Cambridge, but for the most part of my career I was just outside Ipswich in Suffolk. Um, and I then left the local authority, I left there to go to the local authority, where I was working cross-phase, general school improvement, um, but also with responsibility for religious education. Um, left, stopped doing that in 2011. I say stopped, that's code for being made redundant. And um, <laughs> since then I've been working as an independent um, as Lizzie said, I'm essentially working in schools, talking to pupils, teachers and leaders about learning leadership and the curriculum. Um, and then in order to clarify my own thinking, really I write about it, and <coughs> one or two other people, um, my loyal reader, uh, finds it quite helpful. So, um, uh, but essentially it's in order to clarify my thinking. Um, so for the most part, since 2011, I've been an invited guest in schools. Um, but for seven years, um, I was an uninvited guest on inspection, and I've inspected across all phases from early years up to key stage five, um, but I specialised in leading secondary um, inspections. Um, now, what I've learned from that work in and out of schools is the principles of high quality practice and provision that lead to great outcomes for children. They tend to be underpinned by similar ideas and similar principles. So on the back of that, I think it's quite important that we keep an eye on the headlines of what's happening in other parts of the sector that are different from our own. So I asked myself, what might I learn from some of the practice that's going on in, uh, say, maths or modern languages that I might incorporate in an evidence-informed way into my own practice? Um, not the content, but some of the um, structures that might be going on that make, th make sure that children are um, taking things into the long-term memory. Um, I also um, think it's quite important that we keep an eye on what's happening cross-phase as well, because for my money, um, there are two parts of the sector where I think we can all learn a great deal from, and one is early years, and the other is SEN, the colleagues working with people who have SEND and, and also in alternative provision. Because what I've noticed is that those colleagues in those parts of the sector who are working at the top of their game, they've got a lot to teach the rest of us. So, for instance, when... When they're looking at things like, um, you know, the curriculum, they're saying, this is the material I'm going to be teaching. These are my pupils or students. How am I going to moderate the two in a way that is really rich, really robust, sufficiently challenging and with appropriate support in a very, very thoughtful way? And then when you look at some um, early years practice, again, colleagues who work at the top of their game, when you see how they move the learning on through high-quality questioning and conversations... I think, again, there's quite a lot that we could learn from just looking. And one of the most efficient ways to do this is 
uh, through Twitter, just the headlines of what's happening uh, in other parts of the, se of the system. Um, I, I think it's so important that we learn from one another. Um, I'm actually arguing that every department in a secondary school, there should be at least one person who has at least one link with a primary school. Um, because the amount of learning that goes on when that happens is really significant. And it's not just a one-way traffic of secondary colleagues telling primaries how to do it. It's actually very productive for both sides. But one of the things that happens um, when that's happening is that uh, quite often secondary colleagues come back and say, oh, we didn't realise how high standards are in primary. I think this was mentioned this morning as well. Colleagues, this shouldn't be news to us. If we're serious about coherence, if we're serious about equity and social justice, we should really have a handle, or at least one person in every department should have that. So have we got any colleagues where that's already happening? Oh, great. Good. Preaching to the convert. does make a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. And, and leaders need to make the time for that to happen. We don't do it in our own time. Anyway, um, so yeah, just some... Um, uh, I've just got some thoughts to share with you. I've just pulled up a fancy word, provocations. Makes it sound grander than it is. But it gives me an excuse just to chuck some stuff out there. I mean, no one has all the answers to anything, and certainly not me. So I've just got a few thoughts. I'm very happy for anyone to chip in at any stage and say, hang on, I disagree with you. Um, because that's how learning, professional learning develops, when we... Um, share ideas and disagree in a respectful way, that's how shifting thinks. So I always welcome disagreements. I quite like it when people agree with me as well, but I actually value disagreements <laughs> more. Uh, so just a few provocations. So the first one is just around the three eyes that schools are obsessed with at the moment, intent, implementation and impact in relation to the curriculum. So, um, you know, these are just the ways that um, Ofsted are looking at the quality of education in relation to um, to um, their work around both their research and making some um, informed um, commentary and judgments about what, basically whether our children are getting a good deal or not. Um, I think they're quite sensible, but the thing that worries me um, is that uh, some schools are spending a lot of time um, writing these up and whopping them on websites and things, and actually it's the conversations that need to be happening that are going to inform practice, because there's absolutely no expectation whatsoever that the three eyes are on any kind of paperwork, or certainly on a, on a website. So what does need to be on schools' websites are the units and the topics that are taught each year across the school. But that is different. Um, and, and the inspectorate do look at that before they go into a school, and inspector, inspection teams do, do to make sure it's there. But that's a DFE expectation, and that's primarily there for parents. So, um, you know, this notion that we've got to be doing more work, there's already enough thinking to be done. It doesn't, remember, there's nothing to stop us putting an intent statement on the website, but it's the background work that um, needs to go on, and to do it in a rushed way, I think, is a mistake. Um, so I've been playing around a bit with the three eyes. I think um, we might talk about rather the, whether our intent, why we've got this curriculum in this school, is seriously intentional. What follows from the intent? What are we deliberate about? We might say, um, is it invitational? Is what we're offering our children, is it an invitation to come into the big ideas, the big territory um, of our individual subjects? And then, is it impressive? Is what we're offering our children, is it impressive? And are they able to produce something that is quite impressive as a result of it? So I'm just playing around with that um, thinking. But f for the most part, since I've been thinking about the curriculum, I've actually been thinking about in terms of the three C's, just to model everyone. Anyway, so um, the three C's through which I've been um, considering the, cu the curriculum um, are around some of the controversies, some of the reasons why... Um, the quality of education, in other words, the diet of what children are given in their time with us in schools, has gone further up the agenda um, across the sector, largely driven by the fact that this is now um, uh, a much a bigger part of Ofsted's looking at the quality of provision in schools. It does make me slightly annoyed that there is some commentary in some parts of the media, including social media, that the curriculum is a new thing. <laughs> None of us have been doing anything on the curriculum like forever. You know, this is just ridiculous. Um, so I think 
you know, the work that I do quite often, it's about affirming the strong stuff we're doing, um, pruning anything that is less effective or a bit dull, and just refining what we're doing. Okay. And so um, let's remember this is not a new thing, but we're going to talk about some of the reasons why it's got the importance of concepts and then conversations. So the conversations that are going on today, the conversations that are happening in schools, the conversations that the inspectorate are having with the sector, and for my money, the most important conversations are the ones that happen in classrooms. So this is going to be the three things that I'm going to be developing in the time that I've got with you. Um, now there's a number of reasons why the quality of provision, the quality of education um, has increased and um, and so these are some of the reasons. So quite a few, but I've just summarised them into three. So the first is, is that both my work and Ofsted's work have found that um, uh, in some schools, priorities have become distorted um, in, um, actually, not in a, it's not a blame game, but actually what's happened in some schools, for instance, in primary, in order for children to do well in, their, in the key stage two SATs, what's followed from that is that some children have a pretty much a diet of SATs tests in year six, sometimes drifting into year five, in the mistaken belief that constant comprehension and inference um, test um, papers are going to get them better at comprehension and inference. <coughs> now, children need some practice. Any more than some practice, it doesn't make any difference. Keep giving them practice and they actually go backwards. Um, so when you look at the reading paper uh, for SATs, um, and they're analysed for the children who don't do so well in the reading paper. By and large, it's a lack of vocabulary. So how do we develop children's vocabulary? Some schools are interpreting that as children are having lists of spellings. Well, the spellings are obviously important, but vocabulary development is a much bigger uh, story than that. They, they develop their vocabulary through a broad and balanced curriculum. Um, we also know that um, about 50% of secondary schools have got a three-year stage four. So that's asking some questions about, well, children have got an entitlement to a broad and balanced curriculum to the end of year nine, um, and some students are not studying some important subjects um, after the end of year eight. So some questions around that. It's not hard and fast. It's not a limiting judgment, but we've got to be asking ourselves, why are we taking three years to do a qualification that's designed to be taught in two? You see why colleagues are arguing for that, because specifications for more demanding content has gone up. But then, how strong is Key Stage 3 is, the, is, the, is one of the questions we need to be asking around that. So, um, it's just opening up some of these conversations. Um, then there have been some misconceptions about the curriculum. So, um, you know, when also we're doing their research and they were talking um, to senior leaders, they talked to us about, you know, what's the curriculum? You know, why have you got this curriculum in your school? Tell us about the curriculum. Quite often, the conversations wouldn't move beyond the specifications and the timetable. A curriculum offer is a bigger agenda than that. Um, there have also been some misconceptions around skills and the primacy of skills, as though skills are the only thing really that really matters, and as though it's irrelevant what content children learn, what knowledge they know. So this idea that skills are somehow separated from rich knowledge is a mistake. Because just because I can analyse something well, say, in geography and evaluate it, does not mean to say that I can do the same in history, if I don't know any history. So this idea that skills are all that matters is a mistake, and children lose out. Um, so we've had examples of children in year seven um, being given practice papers, AQA language paper two in year seven, in the mistaken belief that their skills are going to get better um, by the end of year 11, in, in, you know, in what they need to do by the end of year 11. This is a completely hollowed out curriculum. I'm going to get better at those skills by a really rich entitlement at key stage three, not through this sort of just practicing the skills separately um, from deep, rich content. It also begs the question, why on earth are children being given um, um, GCSE work at all at key stage three? They're, t they're two separate parts. We don't want to see them as a continuum, continuum, but our children are not in key stage three just to get them good results at key stage four. I know a lot of schools are under pressure to have that view, but this is a moral question about what a curriculum is for. 
it's bigger than the exams. Um, in primary, some of the misconceptions have been around um, topic work and um, cross-curricular work, where sometimes there's been a bit of a muddle where, for instance, um, a theme on colour, which is a great theme, for instance, on um, uh, for obviously art, maybe get some science out of there, possibly some geography and literacy, but by the time it landed in history, it was the Black Death. <laughs> so the underpinning rationale um, from an intellectual point of view is kind of missing. If it's important children learn about Black Death, we do it, we do it, teach it separately. Um, so it's quite important that whatever it links are made, have we got many primary colleagues here? One or two, I'm sure we're not making a mistake, but it, we have to cross. Um, that, you know, the dignity and the um, integrity of the subjects is allowed to sing, that's the important thing. Um, and that children know that they are studying and learning about certain subjects. I had a colleague of mine who was talking about um, asking children what they, what they had been learning in history in Key Stage 2, and they said, oh, we haven't learnt any history, we, we don't do history. Why are we doing stuff? It's learning, isn't it? We don't do the Romans. We don't do Romeo and Juliet. We're learning it. Obviously. Poor Romans. Anyway, um, he said, oh, we don't do history at this school. He said, I thought you would be learning about the ancient Greeks. They said, oh, no, 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 that's not history. That's topic. <laughs> so there have been some misconceptions around this. Well, that's one of the reasons why this is being sharpened up. Okay, and then there's the notion of entitlement. So um, both my work and Ofsted's work has, has shown that um, there are some of our children who get so who might need some additional support. They get so much additional support that they're missing out with the rest of their peers. Um, so we, we need to be very clear that those children who do need, I don't like the word interventions, a bespoke individual support, that it is as focused and as effective and has impact as quickly as possible so they're back with their classmates as soon as possible. Otherwise, the gaps are going to widen. Um, uh, yeah, I won't say any more about that now, so I'll probably pick it up later. Uh, but beyond, um, beyond that, um, you know, in terms of entitlement and difficult work, when I talk to children, um, student and pupil voice is a, is a research interest of mine. And um, in fact, if I ran Ofsted, I'd, I'd make pupil and student voice the first blank of evidence on inspection. This is why I'm not running Ofsted. <laughs> But what, what I found is, is that nine times out of ten, what children say about provision, um, I would just say about the school, there's a very strong correlation to the final judgment. Um, so it's nothing as crude as, and this is from key stage one up to key stage five, the only area I haven't done it in as early as, um, but it's, they don't say anything as crude as, oh, it's measures here, don't you know, or it's outstanding, it's nothing as blunt as that. Only adults use that sort of language. But when you, when you ask them about, it's two things. When you ask them, can you tell me about um, some of the things that go on in your lessons that really make you think <coughs> and where you're really working hard? Um, the kinds of responses they give are very illuminating. A bit of evidence to tell a big story. And then um, that's one strand. The second strand is how articulate they are in expressing those ideas. And that tends to be, I've found nine times out of 10, has a very, very close correlation with what you find with the final judgment. So anyway, um, what I've found in, in my work is that uh, uh, across the sector, a lot of our children are asking for more demanding work. So I think we're inclined to, as a sector to make too many things too easy for too many of our children. Um, and uh, in the mistaken belief that they can't cope. So one of the threads of my work is that children need to be given demanding, challenging work above their pay grade with appropriate support, because that tends to be what they're saying, and they can cope with it. Um, so, I was doing a, a piece of work um, in a North London school, so I've got a secondary example and then a primary example. I was doing a piece of work in a North London school uh, about 18 months or so ago, and as part of that work, um, the school asked me to talk to some students that they'd identified as being high prioritaining but underachieving, able but idle. Do you have any of them? Yeah. Well, I know exactly what they look like because I managed to produce a couple myself, so... <laughs> <laughs> They've grown up it now, which is why I can joke about it, but I tell you... <laughs> I tell you, when they were teenagers, um, it was very hard as a parent and as a teacher. Anyway, um, so anyway, I was working with these students and... Um, there were year nine, so about eight of them, and they happened to be all boys. 
And I said, is there any part of the curriculum, is there any subject in this school where you're not mucking about? Because the issue was they weren't working, but they were stopping others from learning as well. And in this school, it turned out it was geography. So I said, well, tell me what's going in geography, on in geography. That means you're doing your best work then. And they said, our teacher just gives us really interesting things to read and to talk about. Read for homework, and then we talk about it. Um, for instance, she'll give us <clears throat> articles to read from publications like the National Geographic. And what she says is, your job for homework is to read this. Now, you're not going to understand it all, but um, that's all right, because we're going to talk about what you did understand and what you didn't understand at the start of the next lesson. So pitching it above their pay grade and supporting them through discussion and talk. And um, they were lapping it up. They said, sometimes we get material that we used in universities, don't you know? I mean, they were quivering with excitement, these boys, bad boys. <laughs> and um, I was in this teacher's classroom later that day. She had the same high expectations for all the students. It was a mixed prior attainment class, regardless of their starting points. And um, when I looked at the results, the highest results in the school, in a high-performing school, ditto nationally. Now, that teacher did not give those children that material in order to get great results. The great results followed from giving the students stuff above their pay grade and then supporting them to get there. It's that way round. Um, now, the next example is from primary, and it's from Alison Peacock's book, Assessment for Learning Without Limits, uh, which came up um, in 2015. Uh, excellent book. Um, recommend every school should have one. And um, Alison's now the CEO of the Chartered College of Teaching. Has, is anyone a member? Or your school's a member? Some of you are, okay, great. Uh, doing really, really fantastic work at the Chartered College of Teaching. Um, I'm arguing there should be at least one person in every school who's a member of the Chartered College of Teaching um, because the resources are fantastic and that their membership should be paid by the school. I'm very good at spending school's money. <laughs> but it's not very much, it's that important. Anyway, when um, she was writing this book, it says that for learning without limits, um, she and a colleague interviewed some pupils as they were going from year five into year six, and um, they were trying to tease out about what the children thought of ability tables in, in, in primary. But the, the responses from the pupils were actually about provision and about challenge, which is why I'm using this example. But I'm just going to say a few words about uh, my concerns about the term ability. Um, I have great concerns about the use of the word and the implications of the term ability within the sector when there are consequences for children. Um, in fact, I think it's a deeply flawed concept when there are consequences. I'm not denying that there are different abilities. It's when there are consequences of people making judgments about what children can do. So. Um, uh, all I can talk about with any kind of reliability is what have my children done up until now. All I can really talk about is prior attainment. But the minute we start saying, um, labelling children, and there are consequences of that low, middle and high ability, um, we're actually putting limits on children's learning, particularly for the low prior attainers. Um, my concern is two, threefold, actually. The first is is that by and large, the children on the lower bottom tables, where they're stuck, you know, I'm not talking about bringing children together because we all be up the last lesson, then you go back. But um, when they're stuck on bottom tables or bottom sets in secondary, they tend to get a diminished diet. They don't do such demanding work as their peers. Not in all cases, there are some fantastic examples where that's not the case, but by and large, those children do not get the same rich diet as their peers. My second concern is that they tend to have the least qualified and the least um, experienced adults working with them. So this is not to have a go at TAs, HLTAs, NQTs, RQTs, but we have got to ask some questions about why our most vulnerable children are working with the least qualified and least um, experienced adults. So I do a lot of work with TAs, HLTAs, um, NQTs. I've got a lot of respect for them. So it's not that. We've just got to ask these questions. Um, my third concern is, is that if you look <clears throat> at the profiles of the children who are on the bottom tables and the lower sets in secondary, a higher proportion of those children have people premium funding. So what's that about? Because um, however we determine intelligence or IQ, I refuse to believe it's linked to postcode or parental wealth. 
And yet, as a sector, we're always going on about closing gaps, diminishing differences, equity and social justice. We have some structures within the system that are compounding those gaps and widening them. So it's not, <clears throat> it might not be happening in your schools, but I think we, if we think this is an issue, I hope we've got an obligation to talk about it, because we're making it worse in lots of example, in lots of cases. Anyway, this is what the children had to say um, when they were interviewed. It's quite small, but I'm going to read it in these slides we made available. They said, um, the first day the children were back, we asked them what they thought of ability groups. The answers were astounding. The more able loved it. They enjoyed being the bright ones and having special challenges set by the teacher. The middle group were annoyed they didn't get the same work and challenges as the other group. They wanted to try harder work, but they'd worked out they'd never be moved up, as there were only six seats on the top table. The less able were affected the most. They felt dumb, useless. They thought they'd never be allowed challenges, as they usually work with the teaching assistant. And this less able group liked the sound of some of the challenges the top group had but they knew they would never get the chance. So we are rationing interesting, demanding work that our children are crying out for on what I consider to be flawed notions of ability. And I think we've got some serious questions to ask ourselves um, about that. Just to expand on this a bit, um, Lindsay, Lindsay Handley's work, um, Respectable, She, um, this book came out in the last year or so. She grew up in one of the sinks estates in Birmingham. She's a writer and a journalist. And she's talking here, she went to school in the early 1980s, and she's talking this book about um, a teacher in year five. And this is what she says about him. He took us seriously, not in the sense that he treated us like miniature adults, but in the way he acted upon his belief that we had a right to be heard and that we were mu as much a part of society as any adult or middle class child whose right to be heard, to form and express an opinion and to have it interrogated. At the beginning of the year, Mr. Bowell instigated two weekly institutions, the general knowledge quiz and the classroom debate. In hindsight, the reason these felt so special, so invigorating, was that both were vehicles for verbal reasoning and for testing abstract concepts, neither of which our previous teachers have paid particular attention to. I never saw stronger evidence that you are taught how to be inarticulate and you learn how to be ignorant through what is withheld from you. Mr. Bowell gave us the chance to talk and to reason before our ability to do so was allowed to wither from inattention. So the argument I'm making is that our children, regardless of their starting points or their backgrounds, are, entitlement, are entitled to a really rich, demanding curriculum, I would argue, above their pay grade. So I'm going to turn now to the second of the C's, and that is concepts, and why the concepts are so important. Um, so they act as holding baskets within, um, into which a lot of information can go. Now there's a huge amount of um, emerging work from cognitive science, which is always provisional, there's no research which is absolutely hard and fast, but it's making very clear that learning is likely to be deeper if we have taught concepts to children explicitly. And for the first time in the framework, um, it talks about the extent to which um, children have been taught the concepts. So these are the big ideas or the holding baskets, um, and they start creating um, much more coherence and, and structure for our children when we make um, a point of identifying them. So, um, I'm arguing that they contain hidden gems um, because a lot of the words um, that are the conceptual words, they're quite often three, three tier, tier three vocabulary and they quite often have words with roots in other languages, quite often they're Latin and Greek. So I'm making the case that they contain hidden gems when we go into the roots of those words or the etymology. And I find it interesting, we've had at least two other people talking about etymology today, um, beyond um, Arlene's this morning as well. The reason I'm talking about etymology is it starts taking children to a deeper place when we start opening up um, the, the, roots of the, the, the roots of the words, um, of these big words. So, um, and I don't think we can shy away from it. It's that important. 
So I'm just going to share, um, and we're not going to go through all of, of these, but I'm just going to share um, a couple of examples with you. Um, I'm going to take isosceles. If you talk to children in the sector about what an isosceles triangle is, they can generally tell us, because as a sector we're very good at teaching definitions. But I'm arguing that their learning would be deeper if they knew that the word isosceles comes from two Greek words, isos is um, equal and skeles is legs. I've got a bigger mental picture of what an isosceles triangle is if I know that. Also, if I meet isobar or isometric or iso anything else in other parts of the curriculum, I've got a clue it's got something to do with equal. So we're skilling our children up when we pay attention to exploring the stories behind, behind um, these big words. So um, quite often people say this is, for the most part, I'd just be saying for homework, right? That's an interesting word. I wonder where it comes from. Um, code for homework. Enough children will come back and tell me. I'm not going to tick it off my homework thing, but I want enough children coming back and talking about it. If they've been taught to put in the word plus etymology, it'll then throw up the roots of where these words have come from. Um, but quite often people say to me, well, this is a bit hard, Mary. I say, yes, it's meant to be, because the, a lot of the cognitive science saying, if, if learning is too easy, then it's not secure. In increasing evidence that we need to be putting some effort in in order for the learning to be secure. But children need to experience success quite early on to be motivated to carry on to do demanding work. Anyway, um, but I put it to you, colleagues, not only should it be hard in a good way, um, but we've got children in the sector, um, age four, who are fluent in dinosaurs, haven't we? Some of our children know everything about dinosaurs, and only four. And um, a lot of those children also know that the word dinosaur comes from two Greek words, dinos is scary and sauros is lizard. So if they can do it at four, they can do it all the way through. Now the schools that are working on this in an, inten in an intentional way, they are saying that the children with the greatest language deficit are making the greatest gains. And I said, well, how, why is that? And they said, well, when we talk to the children about why they're gaining so much from it, they're saying, well, they just absolutely love it. And one of the things that's going on is making them feel accomplished. It's making them feel clever. It's supporting them to realize that they know, they do know um, some quite difficult stuff. And because it's high challenge, low threat, an invitation to come into this work, um, it's incredibly powerful. And you can see, some of those three, um, tier three words, um, just some examples that I've got there. I'm going to pick up hubris um, in a bit. So some schools are taking this notion of um, the, the, this love of making these connections, which we're identifying with our children, and they're using a lovely resource called Telling Tales in Latin. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, I haven't met Arlene before. We, met, we did today. We made no notes, cross-referencing. Um, but I'm also talking about some classics as well. It's absolutely fascinating. Anyway, so some schools are using this lovely resource called Telling Tales in Latin by Lorna Robinson. And um, it's obvious metamorphoses and um, nice bit of etymological work. I'm not going to tell this to my kids and say, that's a really interesting word. I wonder where it comes from. Code for homework. They come back and tell us. Um, so this is how it starts off. He says, so I'm here to tell these tales to you, which makes me the narrator of this little book. You might know the word narrator, but did you know it comes from the Latin word narrow, which means I tell a story. The word for book is liber, which gives us another common English word. Maybe you can guess what it is. So what do you think your children would respond to that? What would their language Library. They immediately make the connection, don't they? Um, I'm not entirely sure how long I've got. The question is, have we got time to do some... Oh, sorry, Colin. Yeah. There is time to... <laughs> There is time to do some Latin unseen for you. Anyway, you weren't warned on this, weren't you? So I'm going to do high challenge, low threat. We're just going to, I'm going to read this as you follow, and then I'm going to start again from the beginning, and we're just going to see if we can translate it together. All right, an invitation to do this. No one's checking whether you do or not. So I'm going to read it first of all. In a nitio est chaos, no nest terra, no nest aqua, no nest chylum, no nest luna, no nest sol. Air, terra, et oceanus, sunt in una mole. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and see if we can do it. In initio is chaos. No nest terra. 
Ja, no nest aqua. No nest kylum. No nest luna. No nest sol. Air terra at Oceanus. Sunt in una mole. Are in one. Nearly. Mass. And we get molecule and molecular from that. I only found out the other day. Um, is it just me that finds this fascinating? Um, so unless we've got a room of classicists, I mean, I think Arlene's gone. <laughs> um, you know, there might have been one or two people who did, um, you know, Latin GCSE, whatever. But we were virtually all able to do that, weren't we? And um, you'll be relieved to know, colleagues, we haven't got time to do the next one, but we would be able to. Now, so what some schools are doing in primary, they're having a play with this, not mucking about, but in the platonic sense of offering, to, Plato said, um, we, children learn, or pe children learn by playing with lovely things, not mucking about play, just being with lovely things. Um, and then also some secondary schools are just experimenting with this, like, um, you know, mini research stuff into, um, Tutor times where they're building in um, extra reading and just seeing where it goes and some lovely work is coming up. But imagine how clever the children feel when they realise they have worked out most of those words already. Now the point is not to make them young classicists, although I'm, I'm not going to stop them doing that obviously, but um, the point is to get them deeper into a, a love of language and playing with language. So this uh, resource, Telling Tales in Latin, it's on, um, I just downloaded it, it's under 10 quid, took a few screenshots to be able to share it with children. Okay. Um, so the next uh, one very quickly, the third C is conversations. Okay. Um, I don't think as a sector we pay nearly enough attention to talk in classrooms. <clears throat> And that's it, really. <laughs> I don't think we do. Um, if you look at the English national curriculum, there are four elements to the English national curriculum. Writing is number four. As a sector, we privilege writing above everything else, whether it's in English or history or RE. Why? Because it's cheap to check. But we do so we, at, our, at, our, at our, our students' peril, not ours, because if they're not fed properly through the other three, which are speaking, listening, and reading, we're not going to get high-quality writing. There's all sorts of evidence for that. But somehow, because it's only writing that gets checked, that's what we focus on far too soon, most of the time. Is what I'm arguing. Okay, we shouldn't need, we shouldn't need it in the specification to do it, right? Children need speaking, listening, and reading, okay? So one school that takes this really seriously is School 21, I think might have been mentioned already. They believe that oracy, the ability to speak well, is one of the biggest indicators of a child's success later in life. Right, so it's 3 to 19, School 21, all the indicators of deprivation do really well by their students, strong results both in primary and secondary, but they take this really seriously. So they're a philosophy for children school, um, wonderful to hear that earlier, the Socratic um, method, uh, Roman Alexander's work, storytelling school, talk for writing, um, and that feeds into key stage three as well. So their curriculum intent is head, heart and hand, all powered through talk. Um, they take it so seriously that in primary, every child um, in year three gives a four-minute speech to an invited audience without notes. And people say, well, what about the child who's shy? Well, the child who's shy is supported to get there. Don't say to a child who's shy, you don't need to learn your times tables or to learn to spell. This is as important that children need grow in a culture where they are comfortable talking to others. I'm not suggesting all schools do this, but this is how seriously that school takes it. Um, similarly into secondary, I haven't got time to go into that. I just want to pick up quickly um, the fact that our brains privilege story, which I'm sure a lot of you um, have uh, become 
aware of Dan Williams' work, um, the emerging cognitive science, in terms of things going deeper into the long-term memory. A lot of evidence saying the children are going to remember things more and for longer if they've heard things in a story. Because we make an intellectual connection with stories and we make an emotional connection with stories. It's one of the biggest insights, it seems to me, in terms of curriculum development. Power up the stories. And I don't, I don't just mean, you know, um, made up stories. I mean really high quality texts. Um, I don't think the sector does stories well, even in primary, beyond the literacy lessons and the English lessons in, secretary, in secondary. Um, I think they've really got to go up again. One of the reasons why we don't uh, we don't use stories enough um, is because it feels very enjoyable when we're reading to children when we're using this, and so we tend to think we've got to be really busy, otherwise it's not work. Um, if I'm reading to my class, or we are just reading. Um, what have we done? What have I done? I've just found a great text, maybe pulled out some vocab that I want to pre-teach in um, an Isabel Beck kind of way. That means I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did set it about four minutes ago. Is that right? <laughs> um, Isabel, can I? So um, I should be very quick. Anyway, I think as English experts, um, I think you've got a lot of traction in supporting your colleagues in other departments to ramp up the literacy in its wider sense, speaking, listening and reading across their subjects, not least because, and we don't run our schools for Ofsted, but um, there's a big thread in the latest inspection uh, framework about um, uh, the extent to which children are reading, across, you know, and, and reading for pleasure, but also reading beyond English, which to me is a very good thing. So anyway, um, I just want to share this with you before I, before I wrap up, um, that making this case that children can cope with stuff above their pay grade. So this is a piece of work that came out of um, um, Sussex University last uh, year. Um, and they found that simply reading challenging complex novels aloud and at a fast pace in each lesson repositioned poorer readers as good readers, giving them a more engaged, uninterrupted reading experience over a sustained period. So two novels above what would normally be studied um, for the students. Uh, that's all they did for 12 weeks. Radical. Um, three, quite a small scale, 365 year eights. Um, what they found was is that the reading ages across the, co the cohort as a whole increased by eight and a half months, months on the metrics that they used, which were obviously pretty rigorous because it was Sussex University. And um, what did they find for the poorer readers? 18, uh, 16 months. So I, I, don't, I don't know how we can afford not to take this kind of research seriously. Stuff above their pay grade. Give them an entitlement, because what we found was that for the most part, the, the, the poorer readers, the low, the low um, children with low starting points, they very rarely get the chance to get into the bigger narrative. So it's cutting off all those insights from Willingham & Co. about the importance of story and how it can carry children forward. Um, I think there's implications too beyond English, but that's just me. So the notion of entitlement, I'm arguing that underpinning all our work, if we're, if we're beefing up our thinking around the curriculum, should be underpinned by story, whether it's English or anything else. You know, not, not just gobbits of stuff. Let them get into a big narrative. Underpinned by the concepts and the big ideas, really, really efficient, and talk. And um, have I got time to just take through two examples from English? I should yeah. take it really, really quickly. Yeah. So this is what um, one school has done in relation to ramping things up. There are questions about what else might be different, but this is a school who's taken the idea of hubris, that big idea um, that sometimes people overreach themselves and stretch themselves, and then come a cropper. Quite a few examples of that in the run-up to the election, potentially, weren't there? Um, <laughs> but they've gone back to the origins of um, Western literature, could have taken another question in terms of how are we making this as rigorous and demanding for all our pupils. Plenty of time on Aristotle. Why did Aristotle come up with the ideas and the concepts of ethos, logos, um, and pathos? You know, quite often that is just done in a very, very superficial way, a key stage four. Why not spend time to... Um, 
And then what they do, this notion of taking a concept and threading it through, they've taken the notion of hubris, they could have taken epic or chorus, and they have said across, um, across the five years, they're going to pick up this big concept where appropriate and make sure that it is discussed in depth. Okay, these slides will be made available, so if, you, if the photos don't come up really well, that's okay. So only where appropriate, but in Inspector Calls, Romeo and Juliet, um, Antigone, um, Frankenstein. Is, the, is your understanding of hubris similar, or di similar to or different from what we might have experienced if understood it to be before? Taking the children really, really deeply in through a concept. Um, one, another way of looking at it, again through this stuff going in, in greater depth, this is um, Sarah Barker's work from the Orchard School. She, I have permission from both of these, the others were the Queen's School in Caps and Catherine School in Bristol. But she presented this at one of the research sheds where, um, again, this richness underpinning um, what children are offered at Key Stage 3, not just little gobbets, really, really rich stuff. So, um, and non-fiction texts as well, as well as art. Interestingly, art, art is a completely under-resourced, under, um, underutilised resource across the curriculum for developing inference and comprehension. Laying out all the stuff that they want, they've got the time to do at Key Stage 3, so that when they come to study, um, a Christmas carrot, key stage four, they have got this at their fingertips, <coughs> deep, deep in their DNA, a real sense of scholarship about Victorian literature and, and conditions in the Victorian time. Um, Sarah says it starts getting a bit messy, I said, don't worry, all the best things in life make a mess. But look at these great questions around here. Real rigour, real depth, pitching in uh, for children above their pay grade. So, she said you could argue that they are being teaching to the test, far from she knows they're not. What she's doing, what they're doing is they're laying this richness in order to, so, so the children have got this wonderful springboard by the time that they go into key stage four. Okay, colleagues, I am going to uh, leave it there, apart from to say, um, oh, we haven't got time to do that, sadly, that was quite good fun, but anyway, I'll save that for another time. But basically, is what we're offering our children good enough? Because quite often, it's not good enough. You know, is it beautiful? I haven't got time to do all this, but anyway, it's the time went really quickly. <laughs> oh, I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Um, sorry, uh, but you know, if I'm teaching about the Greek Greek myths in year seven, you know, why am I why am I offering my children, you know, junk worksheets of which there are many? Why am I not offering them the artifacts and the art um, from the ancient world? You know, we should not be offering our kids junk stuff. Uh, I'm not suggesting any of you do, but there's far too much. Anyway, we've already heard from some of these people. They're absolutely fantastic. And a few more resources there. We don't have time to Just, go you just before you go, Mary, just, just one minute. Is there anyone's got any questions they want to ask now? Just just two minutes. Has anyone got any questions for Mary based on questions? No? Thank you, Mary. I'm not rushing off, so I'm very happy to chat to people later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.